I kind of like uh, both guys on the break. They both have a good break. Jimmy has a good break. Johnny's young and strong. Uh, I like uh, Jimmy in the position play, experience, strategy, and pressure. Jimmy's been there before. He's a proven, solid player. Uh, Johnny hasn't. Uh, Johnny, these lights might bother him, and who knows what's going to happen. Well, there's that great common denominator, and that is, of course, playing in front of a national television audience. Will it make a difference? Barry Tompkins with Steve Mizrak. These are the Brunswick World Open Nine Ball Championships. We're at Caesars Palace here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Quarterfinal match now between Jimmy Mattia and Johnny Archer. Should be a lot of fireworks in this match. Two very good players. Johnny Archer, only 19 years old, and Jimmy Mattia, the self-styled greatest hustler in the world. Neither one has been in front of television. And so the lag, won by Johnny Archer, who will serve first. He will be playing Jimmy Mattia. Interesting story, and a story you might expect as to how Jimmy Mattia got started in the sport. Uh, I guess I could probably uh, blame that on Paul Newman back in 1961 with the motion picture, The Hustler. I was just a young boy when I saw that movie, and uh, after seeing it, I said, hey, I'd like to be that guy. And sure enough, in his mind, he is. In his own mind, he is. Looks determined, wants to win real today? bad. Not too bad. Good luck huh? to you guys, okay? Have a good show. All right today? Very vocal, Matthias. is. Notice he's talking to the referee already. He's very aware of where the cameras are. Yes. Mattia to break. I said Archer. It's Mattia. Nothing. And a pretty good save. Now, Archer cannot push out here. If he does, he's going to leave the 1-6 combination. Push out. Well, well going to do it. I was wrong again. I don't know about that shot. And Jimmy can make the six in the right-hand corner. But he wants to keep Johnny on the rope, so he might play safe. I think he's going to play safe. There is Eva Mattia, the wife, of course, of Jimmy Mattia, and she herself an outstanding player, a finalist in this tournament a year ago. Okay, more Archer's elevated over the six. He's got to go off the side rail and try to make the one. Made the eight instead. Okay, he he'll hit, take it. He'll take it, a little luck. He, he hit the one first and it still counts. Now, Johnny has not been in this position too many times. Jim started before Johnny probably was born. Well, he was a champion in 1971, and Johnny Archer is 19, so at worst, Johnny's he's won. Johnny's been 19 for three oh. years. <laughs> youngster and, and when the situation gets tough you know if you're not a proven player I like his uh, cummerbund and tie I really yeah do. it's like he just came from the prom <laughs> maybe he did drop the chalk One slight problem, he's got to go all the way back. Right back down along the rail. Okay, well, I didn't want to draw a straight line because I didn't want to draw over his head. <laughs> to... He's fairly straight. He's got to be a little careful here. Good, young, solid player. This is the future of pool. Right? 
Well, he's been in the money 14 out of 18 tournaments. Last year he was in the money 14 out of 18. So he's a consistent player. He's always around it. 18 tournaments is what we had on our tour last year. Uh-oh. Well, he's okay. He got away with it. Didn't want to hit that, but he's okay. He's fine. Slice it in. One nothing Archer. Played first rack by Johnny Archer. When you get even with a hamburger, who do you like? Well, uh, the truth to tell, I kind of like the youngster. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back. Johnny Archer wins the first game over Jimmy Mattia. First to nine wins the match. Johnny Archer has won the first game, and he, of course, will break to start the second. Johnny is a good, young, solid player. He's well-mannered. He's not overconfident. He's not cocky. Uh, he, he knows how to conduct himself. He's, he's, a, he's a good young kid. And this is what our sport needs, players like him. I like the tie. The I tie, like the yes. cover button. Yeah. I even like the haircut. The haircut looks good. Uh, the tie, I don't know. You've you got to have a long extension cord for those. What, what if it's dark? Well, that's true. Can There's that. See you. That's right. You know, the referee is trying to freeze the bolts. Okay, looks like he did. Archer to break. Moving over this time. Mattia broke first, excuse me. Big break. Sometimes it doesn't pay to hit him 150 miles an hour like a soft hit in the pocket in bowling. So it opens up now for Jimmy Mattia. Easy run out here. He's got to come up in between the... Okay, he's got to come up in between the three and the, and the six or the eight, whatever it is, and shoot the three in the side pocket. Okay. Four, I believe. Yeah. Now, now, what he has to do is make the three in the side, make the three, make the cue ball follow to right about here, shoot the four in this side, okay? A little bit harder, okay? Now, a little touchy shot. He's got to go three rails. He's got to go three rails. Got to come off here, 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 and try to wind up right about here. Was I offline a little bit? Just um, about an inch, though. You were all right. I'm sorry. You were okay. Now we've got another three-rail shot. Jim didn't come too... He didn't come high enough. Slow today, huh? He didn't come high enough. All, he, all he's going to do is make Not the six slow. in this. He's got to go three rails up here, here, here. And wind up right about here with the cue ball and play the seven in this pocket. Well, I didn't see him eat dinner. He, he looks a little hungry. He's, <laughs> no, he's maybe suffering from a little malnutrition. There's a shot clock. He's going three rails. Players are allowed 45 seconds. Jimmy makes this one oh. easily. He didn't draw Oop. it back enough. Not exactly what he wanted. What happened there is the, the cue ball went off the two points on the side. He, he just didn't draw the cue ball enough. He's going to bank this. Going to bank it and try to draw the cue ball straight back to where he is. Good shot. Nice shot. Jimmy's playing very well. In the past few tournaments, he's, he's done rather well. Yeah, this was a very good rack for him. So we are tied at one as Jimmy Mattia has a smooth trip through that rack. He's ranked 13th, Mattia, right now. You know, he, he 
he had a time there where he wasn't in the top 16 at all. And then he got serious again, just like I, I did. You know, I have to keep putting that in. That's true, that's you true. Know. You're ranked number three in the world right now. How they look down there, they froze on that one. They froze on the one. I guess, okay, let's rumble. Just wants to make sure. Ty is questioning the rack. Wants to make sure the one is frozen. Very important factor in, in racking. Nine ball, all balls have to be frozen. One oh, what's down. nine? There goes nine. Nope. Almost. Nine almost won. Watch the nine ball now, watch right the, in the middle. There it, watch it kiss in. Okay, I thought it was going in. Almost. Ooh. Almost. Jim has got a pretty decent run out here. Pretty boy Floyd. <clears throat> Gonna have to sh shoot the two in the side right here and float down to make sure that he's somewhere down here for the three ball. Soft shot. Oh. Perfect. Okay, good shot, Jim. Now, he's got to go all the way back. He's got to go off the three, come back up here, back up here, and try to make the four, nine. Okay, he's going to shoot the three, straight up the rail, come back up here. He's dead straight. He's dead straight. It looks like he's drawing straight back with low left-hand English. There it is. Nope, first one was right. That was perfect. <laughs> Routinely perfect. Now he's got two choices. He can shoot the four, or he can shoot the nine. I think what he should do is go for the run out. It's a simple, easy run out. Or he can play the combination. Looking it over. What would you do, Barry? I'm a, I'm a crapshooter. I would play the play nine. I would play the nine only because I have no confidence in myself to run a table out. <laughs> well, he does. He does. Simple, simple run out again. Okay, he's going to shoot to five right here. And he's either going to follow down to about here or draw back right here. Perfect. Now, he's going to come off the six, up here, right about here for the seven ball to make it here. Then two rails on the eight, wind up here for the nine. I'd like to leave those lines in just to see yeah. how far off I am. Now, you weren't off on that one. No. Sand, you? Sand. Yeah, he hit a little too a little hard. hard. A little too hard. Now he could either slow roll this or go all the way over to the left-hand side of the table. He got a little bit too far. There it is, perfect. Nice and easy shot. Simple run out. Two very good racks in yep. a row. Yep. There it is. Two games to one. Jimmy Mattia on a real roll right now and making it look easy. Mattia leads Jimmy Archer. Two games to one. We'll be back. Well, Jimmy Mattia having his moment in the sun in this men's semifinal match. Johnny Archer at 19 years old may have to wait for another day. Mattia leading seven games to two. Go ahead, Johnny. Why? Well, Johnny pushed out and uh, left Jimmy a, a very tough shot to recover from. And Jimmy just said, shoot, Johnny. He made it. Yes. Nice shot. Nice shot. But I guarantee you, Jimmy looked at the two and three. Yeah, the two this. cannot go. That's why he gave Johnny that shot. Go in the hole. 
Now, Johnny is not even looking to play safe, but he's got to. I don't know how he's going to do it. A little touchy shot here. He's got to make sure he doesn't scratch. Good shot. I don't know which shot was better, the one or the two. That's a great shot right there. Well, it's, it's easy to give compliments when you got a 7 2 that lead. That was a great shot there. All I can tell you. Well, Jimmy is snookered behind a three. He's got a couple of outs. He's got a, he could curve it around the three in between the four and five and come back out here and try to hit the two this way. He could possibly go off the rail and try to hit it this way. Looks like he's trying to jump it. I have to hurry. Wait, mass aid. Mass aid, it didn't hit it. But he's seven to two. He can do almost anything he wants right now. Watch the ball curve. Bing. Too much mass A. Watch it go. Bing. Oh. That's, uh, that's what Curtis Strange does to a golf ball. <laughs> yes, that's right. On an undulating green. situation he better not make too many of those just like the other combination was before how easy it was he missed it six in the side follow the ball play the seven in the opposite corner two rails down shoot the eight inside well he's drawing it back Perfect shot. You know, left-handers and right-handers sometimes take different ways of shooting, shooting these balls in, in playing position. You normally want to play for the side that you're most comfortable on. If I shoot, I want to play for the left side because I can reach more balls. If Johnny or Matthias shoots or anybody who's right-handed wants to play for the right side. So it, it really does matter where you position your ball, basically, uh, so that you're more comfortable at the table. So this for 7-3, and Archer not done yet. So Johnny Archer, little Johnny from Twin City, Georgia, gets within four. 7-3 now, Jimmy Matthias still with a commanding lead over Johnny Archer, but it's Archer that's at the table and was had made a rather nice run that game he better make a few nice runs to win a few nice games nine inside oh almost that's what he needed too that might have helped him might have propelled him to get some confidence watch the nine go shooting towards the side bam I thought he made it. Oh, I thought so, too. You know, I think in all our matches so far, uh -oh. uh, just... we haven't had the nine go on the break. I don't believe we have. I don't think we like this. Jimmy said he thinks he doesn't like this. Yes. Well, 
I might not like a vanilla ice cream cone either, but uh, <laughs> I, would, I would take it. Okay, he's got a little problem. The problem he's got is right in the middle of the table, the four and nine. He has to make the three, come off the rail, come over here, and try to get into position so he can shoot this four ball in the side pocket. Did he get enough? Uh, he did. He did. He's got to get away from the rail. Okay, he's away from the rail. Now, he, he's got a good shot here. Uh-oh. He's got a good shot. He can shoot he's the going. four, billiard off the nine right here, come back here off the rail, and mm. come back here. Or, if he was smart, to score the way it is, all he has to do is shoot the four straight into the side cushion right here, make the four go here, here, and stick him right behind the nine for a good, solid safety. We've got two ways to go. Oh, that's the wrong kiss. Hold on, feed me, baby. Ah, oh, boy, look out now. See, I didn't like that. Obviously, he didn't either. Safety. It's going to put the cue ball behind the six, seven, and nine. Bring the five up. Look out, look out, look out. Not, oh, boy. He's got the alley. He's got the alley. He didn't hit that well. He's got the alley right here. Right here is the alley. He can shoot right down between all these balls and make this ball. Johnny should win another game. He's got to get position on the six. He's got to clear the eight when he comes up the table. He did. Okay. Back in the ball game, as we say. Yes, right? yes. Bottom of the ninth. One out. Still got a couple of swings left. Seven to four. One man on base. Hurry. Not to hurry. He was a little light with that. But he's okay. Player of his caliber should be able to handle this. Shooting the seven in the side. We'll slide down back behind the eight. Hit it hard. He did. Johnny's talking to him now. Yeah. Oh, Sequence bow ties, sequence cummerbund, and patent leather shoes. I yeah, love it. Hot. It is for 7 4. So he ain't dead yet. Set ball slash. And Johnny ball Archer seven. back within three. Taya, Eva, and Jimmy. I wouldn't have my wife sit so close because I would be looking at her all the time for suggestions. <laughs> Look what happened here. It didn't make anything. Left uh, uh, Jimmy behind the nine. Let's see yeah. him kick this one in. He's in trouble here. I got seven balls past the side. I got seven balls on past the spot. Hear what Johnny saying? Yeah. He's got seven, he hit him perfect. Seven balls went to the know, upper half push, of the table. Pushing. It's pushing. Now, what Jimmy did is he act he he, he he snookered himself. And the reason why he snookered himself is because he can hit the rail and hit the one. He doesn't want to leave Johnny an open shot, so he had to do that. He couldn't hit the one ball from behind the nine, so he pushed and snookered himself someplace else. Johnny's looking at trying to kick at the one himself. Let him shoot it. Let him kick at it himself.
Johnny looked over the shot clock. Went for it. Okay, you did not want to do that. He got away with it, though. He got me. He got him. But Matthias got a, a good chance of snookering Johnny back. What he's going to have to do, he's going to have to just breeze by the six right here. Breeze by the six and go over to the side rail and clip this one and put the cue ball back here. And I got your back. Yeah. Yes. Got him back. It's one of those matches you don't need any commentary. The players are giving it to you. That's perfect. Johnny said it's perfect. But Johnny's got to go off the side rail. Tough, tough shot to hit because the rails are so unpredictable. Could be long, could be short, especially with Johnny shooting in the air. Hit it. Nope, didn't get it. Okay. Yeah. He's got one major problem right here. The five and the six. He does not know how to get position. Uh oh, look what he's doing. Look what he's looking at. He's looking at the one into the nine into the seven right here and carrying the nine in the pocket. That's what he's looking at. Now well, that would be an interesting combination. Watch it. One to the nine off the seven, nine down. Nope, yes. Nope. Okay. Well, he didn't hit the seven. He just made the nine. That was a brilliant shot. Great shot. I tell you, he's taking advantage of every opportunity Johnny is is missing. Great combination. Great combination. See, Jimmy had trouble in the upper end. Jimmy had trouble in the upper end. And he said, well, let me get this shot going. Eight games to four off a brilliant shot by Jimmy Mattia. He'll, he'll be breaking for the match after this. Eight games to four. Double cheeseburger. French it's looking fries. much better, isn't it? Oh, thanks. <laughs> I can you're eat not going to go hungry as long as you're working time. with me. Yes. I like this. <laughs> so Jimmy Mattia now, eight games to four. Remember the first player to nine. Mattia getting a good break here. Ball's dropping all over the place. But, but he's got to make a combination. And eight to four, you shoot at the cash shoot this combination. Yeah, how do you like that? It's a very, it's, it's a tough shot. Here's the one. And it looks like here's the eight. He's going to have to shoot the eight in here. Okay. I think he should shoot the combination. I move your way, but I can't. Okay. Yep, he's shooting it. Said okay. Now let's see if it's okay. Not an easy combination. I think I'll make it. Oh, played safe. Played safe. And he got away with a save. He really did. Unless the, unless the one and the four are, are in line with the lower right-hand corner. That's what Johnny Archer's looking at now. He's looking for the combination. He can make it. I can tell you now he can make it. He's looking at it, and he can make it. See it nice and easy. Leave the one there. Got it. Well, the position, he cannot hit the one, it looks like. He's going to the side. Ball rolled a little bit too far. I'm trying to elevate the skew too much. It's in the air all the time. Okay. That's about right. That was... Johnny hasn't gotten too many rolls. He's a little disgusted. Straight in, though. And you can tell by the score. Jimmy's straight in. Again, these, these shots are a little tough. Straight in shots. I couldn't, I couldn't, like, shoot it and stop it. I like to throw it too much. Oh, one of the only 
fewest shots in this match. I can remember Jimmy Mattia just well, flat missing. Good. Well, yeah. I guess it is. He hit it pretty good. Thought I hit it good. Have a look at it. Uh -oh, went off the side rail, in a little bit further, and a little bit too much speed. We hit a little slower, I think, and made it. Ever uh, hear of climbing the Empire State Building? That's, That's what, what he's doing. What he's got to do. What he's got to do is climb the Empire State Building. Perfect. He's absolutely perfect. Up the top of the table. Draw to the in rail. Draw to the side rail. Straight back. A5. Things can turn around quickly. Now Johnny Archer is a long way back, but this was a very good game for him. And it came as a result of Jimmy Mattia missing the only shot that he has missed in this entire match. Still, Mattia leads by three games. So Archer to break. He missed that shot and did a dance. I don't know. You, you didn't catch the dance. I did. Left foot went in the air and the right foot went out. And his butt went on the seat. And it might stay there. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny is all over the back line with the white ball. He cannot find a place to break from. Oh, no. It's not good. <laughs> I can't get a break. A fraction of an inch further, the one and the five would have been separated, and he would have been able to make the one. That is tough. You He's got the orange ball and ball and the yellow ball. Yep. And they're practically frozen. Now what he's going to try to do, he's going to try to put the one over to the side rail. He's going to try to put the one over to the side rail right about here and try to drag the cue ball up here behind this six. Oh, push out. Push out. Oh, Johnny, don't do that. He's pushing out. He had a perfect save. I, I sorry to coach. No, that's all right. That's oh boy, what a perfect safe he had. No, yeah. I would not be surprised if Mattia does what I put down for Archer. Nope. Let him go. I think he's got the same shot. Right behind the six. Try it. Yep. Try it. Good okay, shot. good shot anyway. <laughs> Would have saved about five minutes if That's Johnny right. did that in the first place. That's a good shot. Yeah, well, Jimmy's got to go up the table. And if Jimmy loses this game, Johnny is really in the, in the match. The guy that uh, Johnny's talking to, uh, sitting on the side, is Paul Rienzo. He's the, he's the vice president of the Men's Professional Leaders Association. We call him Doctor. Jimmy is doing everything right. Everything. Oh, 
What do you think here, Barry? What should he do? Well, <laughs> that's why you're the color commentator. Uh-oh. Got away with it again. But Jimmy's got a nice, easy hit here. You're looking at the nine. <laughs> looking at the nine on the side. What he was looking at was this combination right here, going to this side pocket. This is the one, this is the nine. Well, he hit it. He hit it. He wasn't realistically looking at that combination. He was dreaming. Wishful thinking. Dreaming. <laughs> well, position on the first ball is the key right here. Oh, oh trying to make it before you can worry about position. Oh, look though. at here. Look at here. Looks well. Look what's happening here. Safety. Well, good position. Safety. Safety. Jimmy cannot hit the one. Good shot. Man. But it seems like a few games ago he had the same shot and made the one. Side rail. Oh, almost, almost did it again. Did it again. <laughs> now Johnny, if he doesn't lose his cool, he can hang in there. Snooker him. Don't bank it. Looks like he's playing safe. Oh, no. Yep, played safe. Good shot. No, huh? I've got this one in and win the match. Maybe, huh? <laughs> you hear what Matthias said? If yeah. he can cut this one in, he can win the match. If he misses it, he could lose the match. Tough shot. <laughs> Can't get closer. <laughs> Great try. I would. I want to ask you a personal question. Sure. Who do you think has more confidence, Mattia oh, well. or Strickland? <laughs> well, actually, they, but don't they play similar kinds of games? You know, I, maybe right now, yes. Maybe but right who now. Who has more? Zippity doo dah. Well, I haven't seen Mattia play before. I'd say maybe right now, today, maybe Mattia. I would always have said Strickland, but I've seen him play a lot more. Okay. I like I like the way you got out of that. That was good, wasn't it? Extricating myself without make, give, making any kind of a commitment. Get himself. He did not want to hit the six. He did. He's got no shot. But Johnny's got to be patient, Barry. 
It's got to be patient. Cannot lose faith here. That's it. Be patient. Jimmy, shoot the bank. Get it over with. Tough to play safe. He did. He made he it. He did, and he got it. What a great shot. Pretty boy. We forgot to mention his name. Oh, we Pretty know. boy I Floyd. It. I love it. He needs his hat. Jim Mattia. That closed him out. That's this for the match. The, the whole big shot was a six. This to put him into the semifinal. And does. Jimmy Mattia. The door was open, and Jimmy Mattia ran right through it. Kiss from his wife, Eva. And a good win for him, beating a very good player. He acknowledges the crowd. Plays to the crowd really well, actually. Jimmy Mattia wins at 9-5 over Johnny Archer. He moves on through to the semifinal. Let's take a look at the key shot once more as we go away to break. And that was a shot right here. Shoot Ball for the was cash. almost on the rail, and all he did was knock in the hole. Great shot. Great shot. I would have done the same thing. I know you would have. Jimmy Mattia is the winner over 19-year-old Johnny Archer. Nine games to five in the quarterfinals. He is on through to the semifinals. He'll play the winner of the Kim Davenport Grady Matthews match. And right now, he is bedecked with sunglasses with Steve Mizrak. Steve? Jim, I, I like the glasses. Uh, better than that, I like the match. You, I mean, you miss one ball. Experience played through. And uh, what do you think? Well, I felt good today. Uh, usually, uh, Steve, if I feel good, I'll, I'll play good. You know, you know as well as I do that uh, a lot of this game is in your mind. And uh, today I went outside, took a little walk around, got some fresh air, and got my head right, and I came in feeling good. Tell me, why don't you take off your glasses? Uh, these lights are too bright for me. And that's not what you told me. <laughs> no, the lights are bright. Say, listen. Tell I'm... me why you told me. The lights are too bright for me, Steve. No, be honest. He, he told me that he didn't want to be recognized throughout the country because he's known as the greatest hustler in the world. You know, people around Jersey tell me that you're the greatest player in the world. You know, I still want to play that million-dollar challenge match. Winner takes all, brother. Oh, you have to win this tournament. Back to Barry. <laughs> Well, there's no question about it. It does get sunny in here. And there is Eva Mattia, his wife, appreciating it all. And why not? He's got a real chance to win this tournament. Well, tonight's Rack and our entire crew inviting you to join us next week.
Check one. Woo! You hear me now? <laughs> Thanks to Joe Canella and to Fat Boy Eric Peterson for letting me know about that. Um, welcome. Welcome to POV Pools Wednesday Grind, Wednesday, May 13th, 2020. I hope you enjoyed that um, match that I played to you. It was um, between Johnny Archer and Jimmy Mattia. And it took place at Caesars in Las Vegas, 1989, uh, Brunswick World Nine Ball Championship. And that was a semifinals match. Give me an audio check in the chat room. And uh, let me know if there's any echo, if there's any, any kind of discrepancy at all, so that we can proceed with this very important day here on POV Pool. We're going to be interviewing Jimmy Mattia, Pretty Boy Floyd, um, who was recently inducted into the Hall of Fame, or I'm sorry, nominated for <laughs> to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, the Veterans Division, which um, uh, they... Uh, 60 years and older category. They um, induct a new veteran every two years. And um, Jimmy Mattia is on that list, uh, just, you know, amongst a few other names like David Howard, Mary Keniston. Uh, I believe Grady Matthews is on that list. Uh, Keith McCready. And just to name a few. Um but um, I wanted to take this time to interview Jimmy Mattia. And um, part of the reason why we are having this interview today is not just because of the recent Hall of Fame nomination, but um, also because we are in quarantine in many states in the United States. Um, there's limited uh, activity out there in the real world. We're all staying home and there's a lot less action out there, um, uh, with the exception of guys like Roy's Basement, who are pro right now streaming Filler and Chohan on Facebook at Roy's Basement on Facebook. You can check that out. That's a pretty close match going on right now. Um, but there's not there's not as many turn. A lot of tournaments are canceled. The World Nine Ball's been postponed and moved to January. The U.S. Open was canceled this year. Um, and postponed. Uh, we've canceled our Cole Dixon. I canceled a qualifier for the U.S. Open. I've I've canceled several events, and um, and a lot of other events in the world are being canceled because of COVID nineteen. So I have made a commitment to our viewers and to uh, everybody that loves pool. I've made a commitment to stream something for you guys every Wednesday and every Sunday. So. If you ever want to check in with us on POV Pool on Wednesdays at around 11 a.m. every day, every week, and Sundays every, uh, every week at noon, I will, uh, I'll be doing some kind of live show. And I don't know, sometimes I'll be playing the ghost, sometimes uh, I'll be doing interviews, and other times I'll be just uh, covering the news and... Um, and, uh, and, and taking on an other guests. So I hope you guys like and subscribe to POV Pool on YouTube and that you um, take the time to uh, check us out every Wednesday and Sunday, at least for the time being, so that we can sweat something uh, during this, um, you know, this pandemic that's been going on. So hi to everybody in the chat room. I want to say hi to... Marwan1420, NineBall.com, B.A. Jen, Frank Curcio, Eric Peterson, Dan Post, uh, Freddie Agnier. Uh, let's see who else we got. Anybody else out there that's watching anonymously? Eric M. Anybody else that's watching anonymously? Uh, Joe Canella. <laughs> Canella Spirits was, is watching. Shout out to all my friends in Las Vegas, too, by the way, and all of you at the Rum Runner. Gino Hill and um, and Gordy Hill, uh, Jim Blakeman, um, and uh, all the other all the other boys. Phil Tatum, <laughs> funniest man in Las Vegas. 
Um, and uh, uh, D uh, Darren Domingo, best bartender in Las Vegas. Actually, best male bartender in Las Vegas. Best female bartender, Katie Scott. How are you doing? Uh, and also, shout out to everybody else in Las Vegas. Now, the reason why I'm shouting out Las Vegas is because Jimmy Mattia lives in Las Vegas. And uh, he's been there for about 30 years. But we're going to talk more about that when we get him on the phone. Um, Jimmy Mattia is a four-time world champion. He, uh, he won his first world championship. Uh, it was a nine-ball championship in 1971. And that's just about 50 years ago in Los Angeles. It was the World Nine Ball Ch Championship in Los Angeles. And then in 1972, he won the same championship in Las Vegas a year later. He was the only player to win it back to back, two World Nine Ball Championships back to back. I don't think the record's been broken yet. Um, and before that, he was playing pool at a very early age. Um, by the time he was 15 years old, he was playing with Willie Hoppy. He started around nine years old. He, uh, he won the Michigan State Championship. I believe he won that three times in a row, starting in 1966 to through 68. He was inducted into the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame and the Lansing Sports Hall of Fame in Michigan. Um, I don't think any any any. I think he was the youngest, um, the youngest uh, player to win the Michigan State Championship as well, and that was by the way that was straight pool I believe. Um, he has also uh, broken other records, too. I, I will ask him about them. He can tell you about them. Um, and um, what, what is, what's the line that Jimmy is late? There's, <laughs> there's not going to be a line on that. Jimmy will not be late. Anyway, I want to thank you guys all for tuning in. Hi to Sargon Isaac. I see you up there. We got to do something in snooker one of these days soon. Um, and I'm really glad you guys are all tuning in. I'm, I'm honored to be taking this interview on with Jimmy Mattia. I consider him a friend uh, as well as an associate um, where he works with me side by side to do some commentary uh, at the finals of the Rum Runner event every year, the Andy Mercer Tournament. And um, I have been looking forward to this. I'm actually very nervous, uh, but I know when I get Jimmy on the line, it's just going to be like, uh, like uh, you know, like nothing. We, we haven't been apart at all. And I want to say hi to you too, Stefano Palinga. <laughs> wow, what an honor. Okay, so I feel like I'm under a lot of pressure here to provide you guys with Jimmy Mattia. Raw and uncut. Let's go. And by the way, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Jimmy has asked me not to do a, uh, an interview on camera. He wants to do this all on speakerphone. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see him, but I do have some photos uh, of him that you guys can look at while we're talking to him. So here we go with Jimmy Mattia. Hello. Jimmy. Yes, sir. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm great. You're live. You're on the air. POV Hi. pool. I just want to I just want to make sure that everybody can hear you first and once we get a confirmation that everybody can hear you then we'll go ahead and proceed. Is that all right? That's uh, absolutely fine. Okay. All right. Hold on a second. Let me just get a confirmation.
Audio good, guys? Pardon me? Hold on. I'm talking to the audience. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're good. He's on time. Hey, fat boy in the chat room said, you're on time, a world first. What do you say to that? I'm on time. I'm always on time. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, number one? Are you safe? Are you well? Uh, yeah, I'm as about as safe and well as I can be for, you know, considering what's going on in the world. Now, I, yeah. I wanted to... Uh, just get your comment on this because a lot of people are probably wondering why um, we're not putting you on camera. Do you want to answer that? Well, the best uh, reason I could give you is uh, I haven't had a haircut in about three years now. Barber shops are closed. I look like Wolfman Jack, and they wouldn't recognize me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Now, well, we'll find another time where I, I look a little bit more presentable, shall we say. <laughs> well, Jimmy, I, I'm sure there was a time in your life where you didn't want to be recognized. Is that true? Oh, well, we all go through the, uh, the pool hustling days. I mean, I was uh, brought up around uh, pool back in the uh, black days of pool, if you will. You know, uh, I mean, it was hard to... Uh, stay alive as a, uh, a professional pool player if you didn't gamble because back in the day, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s, you didn't have near as many pool tournaments as like you have today. So you were kind of forced to gamble if you wanted to try to stay alive because you just couldn't play in one, uh, one pool tournament every uh, three months or so. I'm talking about big tournaments back then. Uh, you know, there was maybe three, possibly four major world title type events back then. So it's, uh, what do you do in the meantime to try to stay alive? So a lot of people were, were forced to, uh, to gamble, you know, how else could you pay your bills? Where did that come from, that term? Black days of pool. Well, you know, I mean, uh, you've seen the movie The Hustler. Yeah. So that, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, that's that's pretty much the way it was back then. You know, you uh, you uh, would play in uh, whatever tournaments that were available. But like I say, there wasn't that many compared to today. I would say for every tournament you had back then, you probably got six or seven today. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, it's a, a much easier uh, for a player today to, to try to make it as a player because he has a lot of tournaments he can go to. But uh, back then it wasn't that way. So it's interesting you say that. I, I recently, I just played a match that you were in. It was your first television appearance, 1989. You remember it with Johnny Archer playing in the uh, the Brunswick World Nine Ball Open. I was playing Johnny Archer. Yeah, you played. <laughs> it was the. I would was, say bet on me. It was. <laughs> What'd you say? I would say bet on me. You'd say bet on you. Well, you did win it nine to five. It's too late to get a bet down. <laughs> too late to get a bet down. Yeah, much too late. But one thing that um, uh, I noticed uh, that, that you, you had said in an interview during that recording was that, uh, you know, they asked you what, when you got into pool, why you got into pool. You had said, I think you probably were talking to Steve Miserak. You had said you watched The Hustler and you, you saw Paul Newman, and you thought, you know, I'd like to be like that guy. Uh, that's a true story. Uh, some friends of mine went to a drive-in one night. I think I was, oh, I would say I was about uh, 12 years old. Yeah. And uh, I had already started playing pool, you know. I, you know, I started playing when I was nine years old. 
But, you know, I like to play everything back then, baseball, football, you name it, any kind of sports. I always loved sports. Mm -hmm. After we had went to that movie that night, and I saw all these fancy shots and stuff they did with the cue ball and everything, I said, you know what? That's what I want to do. Okay. <laughs> and that's the way it ended up. <laughs> so, I think it was like you're 12, you saw the movie, but... Um, you found yourself like less than three or four years later, you're already, you're playing with Willie Moscone. How did that I, happen? I played, uh, I was playing Moscone. Oh, uh, I think the first time I played him was in 1965. I uh, played Jimmy Harris the year before in 1964. And uh, I, I played all, everybody. You name them, I played them. I played so Garrett, was, played was that in a tournament, or was it just by chance? Uh, these, uh, with, with Karras and Moscone, I played exhibitions. But in, uh, in tournaments, geez, I, I played with Luther Lasseter, Irving Crane, Joe Balsas. You name them, anybody from way back 100 years ago on up till, till uh, when I retired. I mean, I played with everyone. Yeah. So, so this is like a period of your life where you're probably learning the ropes from a lot of your peers, right? So. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you must learn. Uh, you must have people help you, and I was fortunate enough to have uh, good players uh, show me things and uh, how you do this and how you do that, how yeah. you shoot that, how you shoot that shot. I mean, it's a it's a never ending learning experience, and it still is. So this was in Detroit, Michigan, right? You, were they letting you in the pool hall uh, to the rack or, or somewhere else? Well, I was from Lansing. Oh, Lansing, okay. Uh, they uh, allowed me to come in and play for free. And uh, I started going to the rack in Detroit when I was 15 years old. Okay. Yeah, what, what memories stand out? From your from that period of your life, like what what were the most fond memories of going to the rack? Going to the rack, fond memories. Well, about all I can say is being at the at the rack was uh, like being in prison. I mean, you didn't have very many friends. You only had friends if you had money in your pocket because it was their job to, to take that money out of your pocket. Hmm. Uh, they had. Great players, great hustlers, and more action in that pool room than any pool room that ever existed. Yeah. And it wasn't a, a family type of room. You would not see uh, kids or anything like that. It was strictly a, a gambling uh, organization, you know. A, a lot of mobsters in there. You had to ring a buzzer to get in. Uh. And it was strictly a gambling place. Uh, it wasn't a place to, uh, you know, I, if, if you were playing a hundred dollars a game, it was like you were loitering. Okay. I mean, you were just basically passing time if you were playing a hundred dollars a game. Okay. <laughs> it was the most incredible, uh, place I had ever seen. I don't think they'll, uh, will ever be another uh, pool room uh, quite like the rack because they were betting thousands like it was water. And this is back in the 60s. Sure. Now you try to compare that to today with the rate of inflation. I mean, it was, uh, was just uh, unbelievable how much money you could win in there. And the only problem was winning, okay? <laughs> That was a problem. Now, you could go out into the parking lot, yeah. and you'd probably see license plates from five, six different states. Ah, uh, okay. So it's like, uh, why go out on the road hustling pool? <clears throat> and you just go to Detroit, uh, rent yourself an apartment, and just stay there, because sooner or later, you're going to make a score. <laughs> I, w I was going to ask you about that, actually, because... You know, the, the biggest room near you that I could think of was Chris's Billiards in uh, Chicago. So did you get a lot of players from Chris's showing up and vice versa? Would, would the guys from the rack uh, go to Chris's? Uh, a lot of the big cities like Chicago and New York <clears throat> and this and that, 
Boy, they were tight with their money. I mean, if, if you had a game for $10, $20 a game, it was like big action. Yeah. And that's just the way it is around a big city. Everybody is uh, very sharp, very leery of everyone. And uh, if they're, they're, they just weren't much of gamblers. They had a lot of terrific players. But uh, to go into big cities was not really the, the way to go if you wanted to make money. So you, you started the rack in Detroit. Uh, I got a real good friend who was my backer back then. I mean, let's face it, you you can't get up and play if you don't have any money in your pocket. I had a had a guy back there who's still alive. I talked to him the other day. His name is Joe Tatro, and okay. he was one of the icons in the rack there. And uh, he met me when uh, we, I was just a young teenager, and he liked the way I played. And then uh, as I years went by and I got better, uh, he would back me against anybody that wanted to come to Detroit and play me. Uh, nobody was barred. The only question was how much do you want to play for? Uh, <laughs> okay. And Joe Tatro, a great guy, and uh, was not afraid to put his money down. So, so... Amongst you, could you could you uh, just tell tell us who were some of the other household pool names that uh, came out of the rack? Well, one of them for sure was Cornbread Red. Yeah. Oh yeah, he was uh, he was definitely an icon. <laughs> uh, he had other great players that uh, you know that stayed there for years and years. Guys like Baby Face. I don't know. Did you ever hear of Baby Face? Baby Face, his name was Alton Whitlow, and I believe at one time in his life, I believe he uh, he ran second in the world championship the straight pool to Moscone. I mean, he was a terrific player. You had all kinds of champions there. I mean, uh, you had champion even the people that weren't champions, they were very good at making a game. You know, they were good at matching up. And the bet was never a problem. I mean, you didn't have to be a champion to see big action in there. I mean, you could, yeah. anybody playing, it didn't matter. You knew they were gambling. Yeah. yeah. And it was a type of place that uh, you didn't pay for time. Like, if you wanted to come in and practice, you could practice all day and all night for three months straight. You got no time. They didn't charge you no time. But if you got into a money game, whatever you won, the house wanted 10%. Mm. And don't want to do that, well, then don't come back. Ah, okay. Interesting. All right. Yeah, well, it was, uh, you know, it was strictly a mob place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the way it was back then. Yeah. So... The rack is kind of like the school of hard knocks for you, and you seem to Absolutely. be doing it. Absolutely. I, I spent eight years in the rack, and I'm telling you, it was like, you know, it was <laughs> like doing time in the joint. Okay. okay? All right. <laughs> and so, uh, they yeah. had park benches all around the place. Yeah. And for the people that got broke, that came in from out of town or whatever, they didn't even have money for a motel, mm -hmm. you would sleep on the bench. Okay, you'd sleep on the on the park bench, and uh, when somebody made a game for you, you're over there sleeping on the bench. They'd come over and wake you up and tell you, uh, "Get up, I got yeah. a game for you." Okay. Okay, and that's just <laughs> that's just the way it was, you know. You were yeah. lucky if you could find a good friend. Uh, you know, they they were strictly there uh, basically to gamble. You know, uh, if you had money, well, you're a friend because <laughs> they're going to try to figure out a way to get it from that's, you. Know? It's really, really interesting that you you kind of paint that picture because when I was growing up as a pool player in the late 80s, um, I used to go to Hollywood Billiards, which was a 24-hour joint. Now, it wasn't the same, you know, as what you're talking about, but they had the benches and people would sleep on them. And sometimes, 
you'd see a guy shake another guy uh, awake and say, hey, I got a game for you. So ah. you're reminding me of what it was like uh, in my early years learning how to play pool at Hollywood Billiards. Uh-huh. Hollywood Billiards. I, I think I remember that place. Yeah, yeah. So, so okay, so you, you, you go into the rack for about eight, seven or eight years. Yeah. How did yeah. you end up getting into the Michigan State Pool Championships? Like, was that was that just a side turn? I mean, you're obviously in a lot of action, but what is it that uh, attracted you to the tournaments? Uh, I'm sure it was the money, right? Uh, you know, I never wanted to uh, be a hustler. You know, uh, the guy who a guy discovered me when I was 14 years old, and he, he thought to himself, "This guy's got talent." Yeah. Doesn't anything but he sure can shoot and anyway by the time i was 16 he had me going on the road and and, and hustling pool well you know i never i never got a thrill out of beating someone out of their money that that really just didn't have a chance with me i'm talking about playing people that i could probably have beat them with one hand i never never got a thrill out of that because that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to see if I could just make an honest living by playing in tournaments. Yeah. But back then, like I say, there wasn't enough tournaments, so you were forced to gamble. But I, I never cared uh, to beat people out of their money. Uh, if you were a good player, yeah, I wanted to play. Yeah. But uh, to beat somebody that was really helpless, I mean, I just, uh, I didn't get any kick out of that. I mean, I made money. But it, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I see. I see. I see. So, so at a certain point, it it uh, it was kind of like more like a job than it was that you were actually in having fun. Well, hustling pool is a job. I mean, you gotta you gotta be a good actor. You yeah. know, you gotta be sharp. You gotta know when to. Uh, when to lose on purpose, when not to. You got to know how to raise the bet. You know, get them gambling, and yeah. and at the same time, you got to make sure <clears throat> that they like you. Okay, <laughs> very important. You don't want to get your thumbs broke. Okay. <laughs> Tell a couple of good jokes. I always uh, I always got along uh, good with people. You know, yeah. and always had fun with people, and uh, that was never a problem with me. You know, I, I never, had, I never run into those problems. Right, right, yeah. But well, also, I, one of the things we used to do, mm. you go into a bar, uh, Daniel. And you're looking, you know, there's action there. And you know, you're going to hustle pool, but yeah, you're here to place. Sometimes it's a little rough. So you go into the place, and what you do, you look for the biggest guy in there. You go up and say hello to him, and say, "Hi, hey, how you doing? Hey, are you, can I buy you a beer?" And next thing you know, you're in a conversation with him. And now you got the biggest guy in the place on your side. So you don't have to worry. <laughs> Not only that, the whole room sees you talking to him. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's one thing. Say hello to the biggest guy in there. Okay, all right. It's a good tip. It's a good tip, I guess. Um, so let, let's talk about the professional side of things because you, you, you have obviously... You've done amazing things even at the age of 16 years old. You 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 went you won three back-to-back -back Michigan State championships. Is is that correct? Uh, 66 through back, 68. Back Michigan State titles. Uh, I don't know how many Michigan State titles I won. I know I won a couple, two or three, whatever. Mm -hmm. And these were these were straight pool titles, correct? Yeah. Back then, uh, the man, you know the. Everybody was pretty focused on playing straight pool or a nine ball. Of course, in Detroit, they played a lot of one pocket. Right. They uh, played some three cushion billiards, you know, mm -hmm. and they played some bank pool. I mean, they played everything there. No matter what you wanted to play, uh, they would say, well, just uh, hold on for a while. We, we will get you a game. No matter what you wanted to play, they would find a player. And the next thing you know, all they wanted to know was uh, how much do you want to bet. Right. That's, that was really the bottom line, how much do you want to play for. Yeah, yeah. So after winning, after winning so early in your career, these three 
state championships. What happens from then? Because you don't end up winning your first world championship until uh, a, f a few years later. So you just you going are you going back and playing tournaments locally and 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 are you trying to go and play? Because I see you you also won a Michigan Motor City Open event in '67. So you're playing other small tournaments, and you also went to Johnson well, City. Motor City was not a small tournament. I mean, that was a major event. They okay. had uh, Hall of Famers playing there. I mean, it was a, it was a it was major a big deal. And uh, I ended up, I was still in high school. I was 17 years old, and I went to play in it. I got, uh, got beat fairly early in the tournament, but managed to make it all the way uh, through the uh, loser's side and made it to the finals and uh, had to play Hall of Famer Dallas West, who was undefeated. So I had to beat him twice. Mm. And we're playing 150 points. Well, in the very first um, game, he had me 114 to nothing. And, well, there was a big crowd of people there, but when it got to be 114 to nothing in the first game, everybody was filing out. <laughs> they all, they all thought it was over. The and there might have been like 10, 12 people left because they thought it was over. Yeah. Uh, no, from there... Uh, I, I went on and I beat him two in a row and I, I won my first major tournament. Wow. Wow. And then you also went to Johnson City. You got high run honors there, didn't you? Yeah, I had a perfect run out of uh, 125 and out. Uh, and I was playing, uh, uh, well, another Hall of Famer, Ronnie Allen, the guy they called Fast Eddie. And that, that was a perfect name for him, I'll tell you, because he, he was fast daddy. He was a talker and a player and a gambler. I mean, he was uh, he was the legitimate fast daddy, Ronnie Allen. How did you guys get along? Were you good friends? Oh, I always got along great with everybody. I, I never had any problems, really, with any of the players. I mean, I liked all those guys. I enjoyed playing with them. And I just, you know, I like to get along with everybody. I don't like to have hardships with it, with anyone. I, I, I just don't like that. Okay. okay. So and anyway, that was the night that Playboy magazine okay. was there in Johnson City to do an article on Ronnie that night. And it just so happened that night in the straight pool division we played that night, I played Ronnie. And so here are all these people with their cameras and everything. And uh, we started the match, and uh, I lost the lag. And uh, he ran about seven or eight balls, and he missed a shot. Okay. Well, these people are still setting up their cameras. <laughs> so they're not, they're not quite ready to go. But I'm at the table, and I'm shooting. Yeah. So now um, I'm on a run of about 30 balls. And by then, now they got their cameras ready and, and yeah. so on and so forth. And they're, they're waiting for Ronnie to come to the table so they can start taking pictures of him and everything. Okay. Well, um, I'm running uh, 80. Now I'm running 90. And as it turned out, I run 125 and out on him. And he was not a happy camper. <laughs> <laughs> because this, this was his night to shine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And I didn't know who these people was, you know. Yeah. I only knew that, well, I'm, I'm playing Ronnie Allen. I'm playing Fast Eddie. So, obviously, uh, you know, it was a big moment for me. You yeah. know, I was only 20 years old. And uh, it was just, uh, you know, something that happened. Right, right. But you, shortly after that, you, you went on to win your first world, uh, world championship, right? Like, just about a year <laughs> later. This was, uh, the Johnson City tournament was in October. <clears throat> so in February of the following year, 71, they had the world's title out there in Los Angeles. So, uh, all right, I'm, I'm going, you know. I mean, I'm a diehard pool nut at that time, you right, know. I love right. to play, love to, love the competition, that, you know, which is, that's what it's all about. So I went to Los Angeles. It was an all-around championship. You know, you had the straight pool, you had the one pocket, you had the nine ball. Okay. <clears throat> well, in the straight pool division, you were put into brackets. 
And anyway, in my bracket, my first match of the tournament was against Boston Shorty. Oh. And uh, <clears throat> once again, 125 points. I ran 125 and out on him in the very first match of the tournament. But I didn't, I didn't end up winning the, the straight pool, but I ended up winning the nine ball. I won the world title in the nine ball division. Right. And then uh, Ed Kelly beat me in the, in the finals for the uh, all-around championship. Right, right. I had won the nine ball. Kelly had won the one pocket. Ray Martin had, had won the, uh, the straight pool. I see. <clears throat> yeah, I remember we were talking about this a little bit. Um, that... Shit. You still there? I am here. Hold on a second. Check one, two. Can you hear me now? Hold on a second, Jimmy. I just got to get an audio check on you. Oh, okay. For some reason, can we still hear? Can we still hear Jimmy, folks? Give me a check, folks. Give me a check, Jimmy. Okay. Sounds good. All right, we're gonna we're gonna continue. Sorry about that. I. Uh, that's okay. That's why next time we do this, my friend, we've got to, We just got to do a video call. We'll get you. We'll get you lined up with a good barber. We'll get your hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, well, uh, well, we're on the air. I, I got to say hello to a friend of mine from back in New Jersey who sent me some masks. He says, are you wearing masks? I said, no, I don't have any of those. He said, well, you're going to, you know, you're, you might die. So he says, let me send you some masks. His name is Eddie Sheehan. He used to be a distributor, I, I believe, for Falcon Cues. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know Eddie Sheehan? No, I don't think I've met him. Uh-huh. Well, I just wanted to say hello to Ed Sheehan back there in Audubon, New Jersey. He's a one-pocket hustler from South Philly. That's what he hustles. Oh, well, you just exposed him, Jimmy, to thousands well, of people, never thousands of viewers. of his action, so hey, I might as well knock you. <laughs> By the way, um, uh, Joe Canella is watching. And he uh, says hello and thank you for doing the interview. Also, Steve uh, Stefano Palinga is watching as well. Uh, we we want to say hi to Stefano. I want to say hello to those all those people before we uh, end up with our conversation. There's a, I got to say hello to all the guys at the Rum Runner. You know that, Danny. Absolutely. I was saying hi to them uh, a little just before we started this. And uh, my good friend Stefano, I, I just talked to him just a couple of days ago. And, uh, well, I tell you what, you're talking about an, an amazing guy. You know, you talk about me and this and that and what I did with a kid. How yeah. about Stefano? Here's a guy really? that was a cop in Rome, Italy. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> from Italy, it was a cop. He went from being a cop to a world champion trick shot shooter. Now, <laughs> to me, that is a pretty amazing mm -hmm. story. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, he went from being a cop to a robber, right? Yeah, right. I went from taking people to jail to, to taking everybody's money shooting trick shots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I that's... Mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, I didn't know that you and... Uh, I didn't know that you and Stefano were so close. I, I If I would have known that, um, I, I, I would have taken the chance. Hopefully next time I'm at the Rum Runner... And Stefano's there. We can have a we can have a photograph together because uh, I I Stefano's dear to my heart as well as Geraldine also. She likes Stefano very much, and I see him every once in a while down in Burbank when he comes to visit. And, he's, uh, uh, he's a true gentleman, and and yeah. uh, I have no idea why they never put that guy in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he's an absolute gentleman and an absolute talent. Yeah. And comes with an amazing story. Why am I friends with Stefano? Let me let 
let me tell you something, Daniel. <laughs> Always be friends with the police, okay? Forget about it. What's the matter with you? <laughs> I, I didn't even think about that. You're hilarious. That's that's. <laughs> That's very true. It uh, couldn't be, couldn't be. You couldn't have said anything more concrete there. Definitely got to make friends with the police. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's move on. I, I want to continue, and we will get a chance to, to obviously, to say hi to all those people again when they're watching. Um, you, you won your first world championship. I want to ask you, um, uh. You know, what? what is it that lies? I mean, you may not know the real answer to this, but, you know, I just kind of want to know what your answer is. What, what do you think uh, that lies at the foundation of a person that becomes a world champion? You know, what do you feel like there are qualities that set a world champion apart from the from the runner up? Uh, is there is there a, a different state of mental beingness? Uh, you know that that, uh, that sets you apart from the guy that doesn't win the world championship. Well, I would think number one, you you must love the game. There's no question about that. I mean, when I was playing my best pool, I played six, eight, ten hours a day every day for ten years. Loved it. Couldn't yeah. get enough. But you also have to have a killer instinct. You have to despise losing in other words i want to tell you something if two people were playing give me the person that's more afraid of losing than he is of winning the one that's the most afraid of losing that's my man because losing back in the day with me it scared me it absolutely frightened me that I'm losing. I could lose this match, and it scared me. Okay. And I just, I just fought hard. I mean, I yeah. if you're going to beat me, you're going to have to knock me down and knock me out and count me out. Because yeah. I'm not quitting. I'm yeah. not quitting. I'm not walking away losing. And uh, that's just the way I felt about it. I come from a very sports oriented type of family, and we do not tolerate losing. Uh, you just. You give it your best shot, and if you can't win, you go and practice and come back until you can win. And it's just having that type of desire, you okay. know. I just I could not stand losing. Uh, if I lost a match, I could not wait until I played my next match. And then if they told me you don't play until tomorrow, I was sick to my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just I couldn't sleep. You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you just, it's just trying hard to, to want it more than anything else. And that's what it was for me. That's about all I had in my life at that time. Yeah. Was, was cool. But that's all I wanted. You know, I didn't care. I mean, there was a time in my life, if you'd have set a rack of balls next to me on one side and Marilyn Monroe on the other side, I'd have taken the rack of balls. Okay. <laughs> okay. I believe you. I believe you. Yeah. Let me, let me... And you just got to have a killer instinct that you're not going to lose. I mean, hey, pool, you know, let's face it. You, nobody goes undefeated in pool. You're, you're going to win and you're going to lose. Yeah. It's something you're going to have to deal with. That's true. It's it's very hard when when it's, it's, it's your whole life. It's very hard to lose, you know. It's hard to accept. So, so, so if you were to, if you were to like put it under a microscope, uh, would you have had like daily rituals? I I, I know that you've bragged uh, to you bragged to a reporter one time that you don't even you didn't even practice back then. Is that true? Well, I mean, there's there's great free players. I mean, there was players that uh, for free played better than I did. No question. What do you mean for free? Like great? You mean the free strokers? Yeah, the free strokers. I mean. Uh, when there's but no pressure, you got when you uh, get under the pressure or, or for the money, you know, they just weren't the same players. You know, they were yeah. the good pl- yeah. practice players. But uh, what good is a practice player? You got to be able to get up in there and do that when you're playing the best players in the world. You know? Right, right, right. So was there any was there any sort of like uh, art to it that like because okay I'll give you I'll give you like. An experience that I used to have all the time, 
there'd be times where I'd be down on a money ball or there'd be times where I'd be uh, you know, under pressure to close the match and I might get down on a shot and there's just white noise overwhelming me in my head. White noise. I can actually hear white noise and it's blocking me from shooting. It's blocking me from white, making white, the ball. White noise? Yeah, but that's just my experience, right? I think I, think I know exactly what you're talking about. And what it is, Daniel, uh, from what I can understand what you're saying, the white noise, uh, have you uh, ever considered yourself as maybe you were in the twilight zone? What are you talking about, a white noise? <laughs> well, I guess... You in the twilight zone. I guess a world champion like you just can't relate, so we'll just move on. How about that? <laughs> I never I never had white noises, uh, you know. Okay. What okay. it what it pool is, and I mean, uh, what it is really is is concentration. I mean, yeah. there was times back in the day when I played like at the rack and I'm playing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for big money or whatever. Right. You could have thrown a bomb in there and I wouldn't have heard <laughs> it because my mind was so focused on the table and the balls that nothing on the outside could bother me because I didn't even hear it. Right, you know? right. So, so, so let me ask you now. So now, now it's like 1970s, early 70s. You've you've not only won one world championship, but you've won a, you've won a second one because you basically went to Las Vegas the next yeah, year. The following you, year after Los Angeles. So. Yeah, you won the second world championship in 1972. Correct. Yeah, I won the nine ball again for the yeah. second year in a row, only uh, this time uh, I won the all around on top of it. When I won the nine ball in L.A., and now here comes the all around and all that, I was really exhausted at that time. You played a lot of matches back then. It ain't like today. I mean, back then you played and played and played. Yeah. And uh, I really didn't understand the significance of winning the all-around. I was happy that I had won the nine ball. So right, I really, sure. I didn't want to pay that much attention to the all-around. I was glad that, uh, that the tournament was coming to an end. Yeah. But then after that, I realized the significance of it. And come the next year when I won the nine ball at the Stardust, I was bound and determined that uh, I'm going to win this all-around title on top of it. Okay. And? And I won it. <laughs> <laughs> and you did, but you, you've, you've broken some records along the way too, haven't you? Why don't you share with us what, what, what records you've broken and, and whether or not they've even been broken again. Well, I was the youngest to ever have won the nine ball title two years in a row i was 22 years old yeah i was the youngest to have won the eight ball title two years in a row i was 27 at that time uh other things that i've done that has, has never been duplicated I, well when i run 125 and out two uh world straight pool tournaments in a row had uh, perfect runouts two years in a row. Nobody has ever done that. Right. So, uh, yeah, I have some records that have never been broken. But as we know, uh, you know, records are always made to be broken. And uh, that's and true. My records, I'd be happy to uh, shake their hand and congratulate them. Good. Okay. Yeah. There's no no harm in getting yeah getting broken. But it's probably always a sense of accomplishment to set the record. So that's that's good. So, so let me ask you about, uh, things start to change a little bit for you after you win world championships. Um, I mean, I, I don't know though, let me ask you, like before the real changes start to occur, because really your life, your life takes a big change um, when, you, uh, when, you, when you meet uh, Ava Mattia, or Ava Lawrence, or Ava Svensson at the time. Svensson, Ava Svensson. Yeah, Ava Svensson, and, and um, <laughs> your life starts to change, and that's in the early 80s. But between that time, between winning the world championships, just before you meet Ava, um, is it just business as usual for you? Are you gambling more than playing tournaments? What are you focusing mainly on in the 70s? Like, what, what's your main sort of, like, uh, ambition, well, your main goal? Well, I tell you, I was hanging around in Detroit. I lived in Detroit at that time after I had won the Stardust Tournament in 72. Yeah. 
And, you know, like I said, I never cared about the gambling and the hustling part of it. Right. And I just got sick of being around, spending my life at the rack. And I just kind of said to myself, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life, uh, spend my life in this filthy dungeon. I mean, it was a dungeon, too. Okay. And so I packed up. Now, here I am. I, I'm a two-time defending world nine-ball champion. Right. I'm the defending world all-around champion. I'm leaving Detroit, and I'm heading to Vegas, and I enrolled in dealer school to become a dealer out here, and that's what I did. I, I finished my school, a dealer school, and I became a blackjack dealer, uh, you know. 72, 73, something like that? January of 73 is when I started working. I, I, I finished uh, the dealer school, and uh, here I am, uh, you know, a multi-time uh, defending world champion, and I'm going to go get it myself a job and go work in the casinos because I was sick of the gambling. I really was. Really? Okay. Yeah. Really was. And there's still there's still basically not enough not enough tournaments, right? No, still at that time there was not a lot of tournaments. Not a lot of tournaments. I mean, if you they would have small tournaments. Now you would have big time competition there because pool players want to play. Yeah. No, so there would be tournaments, but there, you know, there may be like five, six hundred dollars for first place. But you would have world class players there because they want to play, they want to compete. So even though there was no money in it, there was good competition in it. Okay. So, but, but, but then, uh, uh, are you still, are you playing pool? Are you, uh, is Qtopia open yet? And, uh, are any of the pool rooms open and you're playing pool in Las Vegas? Well, back when I first got here, you mean? Yeah, back in the 70s. When I first got here, the main place in town was uh, the Q Club. The Q Club. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, but, but things are kind of slow, right? I mean, obviously you're still entering tournaments that, that arrive in Las Vegas. You're going to the Stardust every year, right? Well, I did until, uh, you know, after uh, the Stardust had the tournament in 1973, that was it. Uh, there was no more Stardust tournaments after that. Oh. And uh, John Zip shut down. Yeah. So those two uh, major events were gone. I see. Okay. Okay. So y you end up kind of... I don't know. It's like the early 80s. You end up meeting Ava. How does this all change your life? Like, tell me what happens there. Well, uh, I don't know. I guess you best thing you could say. It was a bad break for her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, what I mean by that, she comes from a very nice family, you know? Yeah. And let's face it, I, I came from the street corner, okay? Okay. And I mean, uh, she did not come over here to get married, but right. she came over here to play pool. She was uh, 17 years old, and uh, and uh, we had met at the World Tournament in 1981. Okay. And we got along good, and uh, she decided, you know, after she goes back home, she wanted to come back over here and be with me. Okay. Okay, cool. You know, she was, I mean, she loved to play pool back then. She wasn't a very good player at the time at all, but she was only 17. And anyway, when she came back, uh, I went to New York to pick her up at the airport. And the customs was not going to let her out. They were going to put her on the next plane back to Sweden because uh, all of a sudden her green card had expired or, or whatever the situation was, okay. she was not going to be allowed to stay here. So I asked the guy, I said, you mean to tell me that there's no way, I mean, she's crying. She just flew in from Sweden and now she's going to fly back. She's like crying. And, and uh, I said to the guy, I said, is there no way that she can stay here? He said, well, there's one way. I said, what's that? He said, you got to get married. And I kind of looked at her and she looked at me and, okay. 
Uh, let's do it. But I mean, I, I didn't know nothing about marriage or nothing like I can't even spell marriage. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you know, but who cared? She didn't care. I didn't care. You know, if she, if she can uh, stay, if we get married, then guess what? We got married. <laughs> so that was it. That was that was based. That's the story, right? That's the way it happened. I mean, yeah. she didn't come over here to get married. And I didn't, you know, I don't know nothing about marriage. You know, so, I'm just... So next bum. thing she knows, she's living in Vegas with you, right? Pardon me? So next thing she knows, she's living in Vegas with you. No, we, we lived in Michigan. Oh, I, oh okay. I, so, uh, I had left Las Vegas in 1980. Came okay. here in 72. I left in 80. I went back to Michigan. I see. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So, and then uh, you end up, I mean, now you're like, uh, you've been quoted uh, in magazines as being, uh, or in Wikipedia as being uh, uh, America's first and only pool power couple. Is that, is that, how did you feel about that when you heard that? Well, let's face it, uh, there's another record we got that we share together. We're the only husband and wife team in the history of pool. Yeah both won world titles right right no i heard that too no one's uh, no one's ever done that you right, know right right oh so, you know we're it's something for us to uh remember okay okay uh and then you also had a, a daughter together yeah nikki mm -hmm. yeah my daughter she just turned 35 amazing yeah i know i can't believe it <laughs> Pretty time, high. time flies doesn't it Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, time doesn't go any faster than, than it ever did or any slower. You know, it's just when you get older, you notice how fast time goes, which you don't think about that when you're a kid. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you've, uh, you've kind of like, um, you've, you've had, I, I, I don't want to, you've had sort of a bad rap, though, haven't you? I mean... A lot well, of people... you know, I deserved it. Listen, I'm a man. You know, I'll take my lashes when I deserve it. You know, yeah. I got, I became very frustrated with pool. You know, I mean, I walked away from it at age 43. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I wish I would have walked away at age uh, 33 because it would have just saved me a lot of embarrassment because uh, I no longer cared. I didn't care if I won. I didn't care if I lost. I didn't care if I forfeited. And when you get like that and you develop a bad attitude, well, I'll tell you what, partner, it's time to take a walk. Well, and that, that's exactly what I did, but I, but I never told anybody that I was going to quit. I just all of a sudden one day at, at a tournament, I had just got eliminated. Yeah. And I just kind of went up to my room and looked at myself in the mirror and I said, you know, you are a bum, an absolute bum. And... I just, uh, I was doing nothing but embarrassing myself, and I just, I never told anybody I was going to quit, but that was it for me. It was 27 years ago. I was 43 years old. Yeah. And yeah. I just said that I don't want this no more. Well, you know, this is, this is kind of strange, too, because, I mean, you may not be at the height of your game in 1993, but you're, you're, you may not know it but you're kind of you're at the height of your career in the sense that you've already done all these videos these instructional videos and people you're a household name now everybody knows who you are you've got this uh, uh pretty boy floyd image uh you know people probably know you this way as well um but uh, you know is that is that also a problem? Like you're kind of like, is there any duality going on between Jimmy Mattia versus Pretty Boy Floyd? Are you there? Sorry about that. I dropped the phone again. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, is there? Okay. Did you understand the question? I mean, is was there any struggle there? Like, were you having an identity crisis? You know, to tell you the truth, in 1993, uh, was the, the last 10 years of my career was the worst pool I ever ever played in my life. And it all became of the fact that 
he just didn't care no more. Well, I got news for you. You're playing the best players in the world, and you got you got a don't care attitude whether you win or lose. Yeah. It's time to take a powder, okay? It's time to get out because all you're doing is is stinking up the place, and and that's the way I felt about myself. Uh, I felt I was just a a total embarrassment. When I was a kid, I thought I would play this game till the day I died. Yeah. But I I became very disgusted with it. And all the rest of the pro players were the same. You know, we always hoping and hanging around that good things would happen in the world of pool, but it, it never did. And it still hasn't, which I'm sorry to say. Yeah. It just doesn't, uh, you know, if you don't have the corporate sponsorship, you don't have the money there, it's hard to, uh, to make a decent living. I mean, there's a lot of great players out there, and as long as you love to play and you're still willing to give it your all, well, then go for it. Yeah. But yeah. when that ends, it, it's time to take a walk, and that's what I did. Well, I can understand your frustration. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes when, uh, when you know the game as well as you do, um, it's very hard to communicate that to somebody that doesn't appreciate it as, as much as you do. Well, well, I'm a blast from the past. I understand that. Yeah. I, I, I quit it at age 43. I mean, pool players are in their, still in their prime at that age, so one would think, why would you walk away after doing what you have done? Yeah. Well, I wasn't doing it anymore. I didn't care anymore. So I'm tired of being an embarrassment, which, uh, which is, that's all I was. I was an embarrassment and uh, rather ashamed of myself. And before I let the embarrassment go any farther, I said, that's it. I'm, I'm quitting. It's just, it's just not in my heart anymore. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, can you, can you tell me about Pretty Boy Floyd and how that all came about? And, and do you think that Pretty Boy Floyd was a, was a problem? Well, they uh, hired me to do videos, you know, so yeah. I tried to uh, do the best I could uh, with the videos. And uh, it started out as me and Jim Rempe, Larry Lascotti, and yeah. Mike Spiegel. We were the, we were the first four that, he, that the guy wanted. But they all had nicknames, all right? Okay. So now he wants, he's going to do the jackets and stuff for these videos and the other three guys had a nickname. I didn't have a nickname. He said, "What's your nickname?" I said, "Well, everybody just calls me Matai. I, I don't, I don't have a nickname." He said, "Well, we gotta have a nickname." I said, "Well, I don't have a nickname." He said, "No, well, we gotta have a nickname for you." I see. I said, well, I don't know. I said, "When I worked with Minnesota Fats, I, me and Fats worked together for a couple of years, and everywhere we went, Fats used to call me Pretty Boy Floyd." And and the minute I told him that. It took him less than one second. He said, that's it. Okay. That's it. <laughs> so that's really how Pretty Boy Floyd uh, came to life. Uh, only because these people insisted that I have a nickname. And when they heard that name that Fats used to call me, that was it. And all of a sudden, Floyd was born. <laughs> so, so that was like 1988, 89? And, and... This was about 1987, I believe, okay. when we did videos. Uh, and then they came, probably came out on the market. 1988 and so and so we, was this uncomfortable for you at first or was it something that immediately you also embraced uh it didn't make any difference to me you know yeah. i mean i came into the world of pool as jim mattia yeah and i would like to go out of the world of pool as just jim mattia okay. don't call me jimmy don't call me james don't call me floyd i'm just jim mattia that's the way i started out and that's the way i'd like to end it yeah. True. Okay. Okay. You you've been you've been sort of I mean I know I know I know what you did. You left you left pool at 93 in the uh year 93 and uh you never really returned to it uh uh the same with the same No, I, the last 27 years since I quit. I actually have played in in, uh, in some tournaments in yeah. the last 27 years. I may have played in, I would say, six major tournaments in mm -hmm. the last 27 years. 
but I only did it for the fun of it because, you know, I mean, geez, I got to thinking to myself, what am I going to do? I just go the whole rest of my life and never play another game of pool? So no, I get you. I, played, I, I had never played in another tournament again for about 11 years. Yeah, I, I, was, I was done as a player, but there were times when I, just for the kick of it, I said, you know, I think I'll go play in this tournament and just have some fun and see a lot of people that I haven't seen in over 10 years. Right, right. But I was, I was no longer a player. I had, uh, I had no chance of beating anyone that ship said i, I could beat the barmaid are you kidding the barmaid <laughs> asked me to play some 20 a game i had to turn her down okay <laughs> i was not a player anymore so Let's... anybody that's beat me in the last 27 years i got news for you you didn't beat nobody that's for sure yeah <laughs> yeah well i i mean i've noticed uh, in the past just from looking at old footage of you and stuff you've You've also you've also tried to make some different career moves. Like you you, and you've also you you've done a hell of a job doing it. Like uh, working as a commentator in sports too, right? Well, I know the game, and I like you know people. Sometimes I listen to a lot of these commentators. They take it way too serious, you know. I mean, I'm the type of a commentator. I want to, you know, pool is a fun game, man. It is. <laughs> Playing pool, let's face it, it's a blast. And if you get involved in any type of competition, it's even more fun. Yeah. But there's also the flip side of that coin, you know. It's fun to play. It's fun to compete. But in another sense, that's where it ends. Yeah. Okay. So when I commentate, I want to have fun with pool. You know, I want to be able to people to laugh and have a good time and enjoy the match. And Absolutely. Not take it quite so serious. You know, a lot of these commentators I listen to, yeah, all they ever talk about is the two ball and the three ball and the four ball. They never tell a story. They never crack a joke. Right. I mean, loosen up. Have some fun, <laughs> man, because this is what it's all about. Mm. Pool is fun. Well, I gotta say, you know, I've had a lot of fun commentating with you at uh, the Andy Mercer, and I've had a lot of fun listening to you commentate, uh, you know, at the Jay Swanson Memorial and uh, other events. Oh, I have a great time there. It's yeah. fun, and it's fun to watch the great players of today. And, yeah. and yeah. when you, uh, I know you know the Andy Mercer probably better than I do. Uh, it's a uh, it's a great event with a lot of magnificent players. It really is. I enjoy watching the great players of today. I wish I would have had a chance to play with them uh, years ago, but they weren't around then, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, I will always miss the competition, but I don't miss it enough to ever want to play again in the last sure, twenty seven sure. years. I don't miss it enough to play now. I'm all done. You can throw the dirt over me. <laughs> well, I don't want to throw dirt over you yet. Uh, uh, <laughs> actually, I'd like to put you on the spot, if I may. I, 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 I've, uh, I've always wanted to ask you this. Uh, you know, it's, um, there have been people in, in the pool world that have crossed paths, you know, like ships sailing by. And I wanted to know if you'd played any of these guys. And you can just give me, a, you know, 10, 10 second answer on who, what you think of them as a player, or, or, uh, or, or whether or not you played them at all. Is that okay? You want to do that with me? You name them, I played them. Okay, Joe Balsas. You know, the years after I retired, you know. Joe Joe Balsas. Have you played Joe Balsas? Sure did. Must have played him. Must have played him. I would say probably four or five times. And I never could get fired up to play him. And the reason for that, he reminded me so much of my father. Uh. Joe Balsas and my father could possibly pass for brothers. <laughs> and every time I played him, I just didn't have the fire. Okay. You know? I, right. I don't know if it was just something about him that reminded me of my father. And I never beat him one match. Uh, we must have played four or five times. I just could not, uh, just couldn't do it, you know? Understood. <laughs> okay. 
What about Irving Crane? Irving Crane, of course, I, I played him, uh, oh, geez, uh, two, maybe three times, uh, probably beating two out of the three. Okay. Uh-huh. Cicero Murphy? Cicero, I never lost a match to him. Okay. Freddie the Beard. Freddie Bensavegna? Yeah. Well, Freddie was a one-pocket player and a bank pool player. He, he wasn't a, a nine-ball player or a straight pool oh, player. Oh, that's, that's true. You, you, were, you didn't play a lot of one-pocket, did you? No, uh, in Lansing, Michigan, where, which was my hometown. Yeah. For whatever reason, bank pool and one-pocket, it was very rare if you ever saw anybody playing a game of one-pocket or bank pool. They just didn't play it. I see. In Lansing, now you go 70 miles uh, southeast to Detroit. They played it. They played everything. Right. But in Lansing, no, uh, no banks, no one pocket. Okay. How about um, how about Jay Swanson? Played Jay Swanson. Uh, geez, uh, how many times would I play Jay Swanson? A uh, couple, two, three times, I would imagine. No. And he, another terrific player. Uh, that also, he only had one eye. And well, that's it. well, like like my our, my good friend Jim Blakeman. Yeah. A terrific player. And here's a guy that only got one eye. I mean, I used to think to myself, boy, how do these guys play so well? <laughs> and they only have one eye. It was uh, right. kind of mind-boggling to me. Yeah, yeah. And I also noticed every time I played a left-hander. I never saw a bad left-handed player in my life. Like every guy that plays left-handed is a good player from everyone that I ever saw. It's right, like, right. what is this unfair advantage to be a lefty? <laughs> I mean, you know. What about uh, what about Bobby Hunter? Uh, J Jamie Susueto wanted to know if you played Bobby Hunter before. Oh sure, Bobby Hunter uh, came uh, fifty miles from from me from Lansing. Bobby Hunter was from Grand Rapids. Yeah, yeah. And I remember playing him in a tournament in my hometown in uh, Lansing one time, 125 points. He ran 125 and out on me. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Bobby played real good pool. There was yeah. no question about that, you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see, what about, uh, how about Robert LeBlanc? Uh, he lives in Vegas, too. Do you ever play him? I don't believe I ever played the... Uh, uh, LeBlanc. Bobby they, Cotton. They called him Cotton. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't don't ever recall uh, playing him. Uh, you know, of course, he, I don't believe, I don't know if he was around then uh, back in when I was playing my best pool. I mean, I, yeah. I, my best pool like in the late 60s and, and throughout the 70s. Right. So right. I don't never recall. Uh, no, we, I don't believe we ever played, no. How about... Uh... How about some of the Latin guys, Moro Paez, Ernesto? Ernesto, I uh, I used to beat Ernesto like pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I always played very good when I played Ernesto. Yeah. And yeah. Basically, just kind of run over Ernesto. Okay. I'll tell you an interesting story about that, seeing as how you mentioned him. Yeah. Uh, the last time I had ever played him, geez, I would have to say it was probably in the, maybe in the 80s yeah. uh, time, yeah. but uh, he beat me, you know? And I mean, I used to run over Ernesto like 11-2, 11-1. I mean, it was no contest. Yeah. And the last time I had ever played him, he, he beat me. And I was like so upset that I actually sold my cue stick after that. Match. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. But uh, boy, I tell you what, he's a terrific player and he's, he's a nice guy. Yeah. He never says a word. He's a true gentleman. And, yeah. and boy, his, his game really elevated. Like when I was just warping all over him, uh, he really wasn't at his best yet. Yeah. But it, it was about to come some years later, you know. I mean, he yeah. got. He got really playing good, and his son Oscar 
Yeah, he's a terrific player. Sure and is. Both really, really nice guys. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, your your niece Monique uh, is watching. She said to say hello. All right, I'm 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 her favorite uncle. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi to you, Monique Mataya. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. Well, you know we're kind of like uh, we've been going on now for about an hour. Um, I, I want to ask you a couple of the hard questions. Is that all right, Jim? Ask me anything you want, and you will get the answer. Okay, okay. <laughs> you, um, you, you've recently been uh, nominated um, in sort of the veterans category for the Hall of to be inducted into the BCA Hall of Fame. This is a, a nomination that comes every two years. Um, it's alternating between the uh, meteoric rise players and the veteran players. Now you've been uh, nominated with uh, several other players and several other individuals that are all deserving, um, you know, of, uh, of recognition, such as Keith McCready, uh, David Howard, uh, uh, you know, Mary Keniston, uh, Grady Matthews, just to name a few. Um, so, you know, first off, I want to congratulate you for being nominated. Well, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you about that. Uh, it's the first time in my life that I have ever heard that I was nominated. If I had ever been nominated before, I didn't even know about it. Sure. So it's pretty hard for someone to be nominated for a Hall of Fame in any sport and you don't even know it. And, and not so, know, yeah. Um, I don't, as far as I'm concerned, this this is the first time that I know of yeah. that, I, uh, that my name was ever thrown into the hat. For, for the National Hall of Fame. I mean, you're already, you're already in the Lansing uh, Sports Hall of Fame, the, the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame. You're in two Hall of Fames. Uh, for for the state of Michigan, um, uh, yes, but uh, you know, w w this is a little bit different to you, is it not? Well, it's something that I I gave up thinking about years and years ago. You know, I it, it's just it never even crosses my mind anymore about the Hall of Fame. You know, even even when I was a player in in '93 when I quit, yeah, I still. Uh, I never even uh, gave the Hall of Fame any consideration at all. Uh, just, it, just something I never, never thought about. You know. Right. Now I think about it, and uh, I wonder uh, why I had never ever even got a, you know, a, a nomination. I, you know, and I began to think about that, and uh, you know, let's face it, I was a little, little upset about it. You know, to be honest with you, but okay. uh, even like even like right now, I'm like kind of shocked. I had to ask somebody, uh, "Are you sure that you know that's me?" <laughs> they want you know, I'm actually on the list. Are you sure about that? <laughs> yeah, because it's uh, it's uh, all new to me. You know. Well, I know that uh, I know that uh, I mean, I'll just I'll just talk from my experience. I know that um, Jose Perica uh, for quite some time he was. He was wondering why am I not being nominated uh, or, or, or inducted into the Hall of Fame? It's just he just feels like, you know, it's it's just been an uphill battle for him. And finally, he was nominated and uh, and inducted and voted into the Hall of Fame. So I mean, do you? And definitely so. He's a terrific player. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like you're you're not the only one? Or I mean, I, I mean. I mean, and now you look, you know, some of your peers, Keith McCready, Grady Matthews, rest in peace. I mean, uh, those guys, are, are they just as, as deserving as you are? Or do you feel like you uh, you should have been maybe nominated a little earlier than these guys? How do you feel about that? Well, to tell you the truth, when you talk about this Veterans Hall of Fame. Yeah. The first thing that actually came into my mind when I had heard about this is I feel in my own mind, in my own honest opinion, okay, 
Uh, why am I being nominated for like the old folks home? <laughs> like, in other words, when I would, was winning world's idols, why was I never nominated back then? Yeah. Why, why did they wait until I'm uh, in a wheelchair, <laughs> so to speak? You're, he's not in a wheelchair, guys. I feel myself, honestly, I feel... I don't want to be one of the competitors of the Veterans Hall of Fame. I would like to know why can I not be nominated against the best players in the world today? I understand. So, I understand. Uh, you know what? If you're going to try to be the best in the world, you got to get out there and beat the best, okay? You can't say, well, I'll play this guy, but I won't play that guy. Yeah. You want to be the best, you want to consider yourself the best, then you go against the best. Yeah. For my money, I would take my credentials and records that have never been broken. Why would I be ashamed to go against the great players of today? They can take their credentials, I'll take mine, and if you got somebody that's better than me, all I can say is take the pot, my friend, they deserve it. But one thing's for sure, they better be pretty good. They better have some pretty good credentials. And I want to see if they got any records that have never been broken. Yeah. So I would like to compete against them, you know, because I don't feel as though I'm the best if I, if I didn't beat the best. And it's just, it's just kind of, it's a strange feeling for me. Like, I'm, it's an honor to be nominated finally, you know? I mean, let's face it, it's an honor. Yeah. In my own sure. heart, I feel like I'm, I'm in a competition with, well, with six people that have passed away, and God rest their souls, because they are all great friends of mine, all great friends of mine. I was sick to my stomach when I heard they passed away. But I feel like, you know, I'm competing with someone that's not here to speak up for themselves. Why can I cannot? Why can I not compete against the great players of today? They have their credentials. I have mine. And if yours is better than mine, like I say, take the pot. I don't have any problem losing to somebody that's better than me. Yeah. And that's just kind of the way I feel about it. You know, it's just, it's a funny feeling to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean. <sighs> You know, I don't want to get into the ins and outs of uh, the selection or uh, the voting committee or anything like that. Um, I know that it's probably very difficult, uh, a very difficult, like almost a burden to have that responsibility to be able to, uh, you know, um, draw the right names and uh, and the timing of said names. Um, and, uh, and Well, there's so many great players out there. I know the Hall that's of Fame is a difficult job. You know, they, they can only select one person or two people, whatever. That's true. And yeah. you, you take a look at all the amazing players they are. You know, it, it's not an easy job. It's not. It's not. And so, be that as it may, I can only just congratulate you. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, you... Um, you know, I feel personally that you're definitely deserving of uh, of this place in history, and uh, and I hope that um, that if you are inducted uh, this year, I, I hope that you're satisfied with it, and uh, and that um, you know, I just wish you the best. You know, I mean, I consider you a friend, so um, with, no, I, I with don't that, want anybody voting for me because we're friends. If you want to vote for me, it's because you thought I deserved it. I don't, I don't care for all this friendship stuff. That oh, no, 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 I don't. Uh, if someone doesn't think uh, that I deserve it, that's fine. But I don't want anybody voting yeah. for me just because we're friends, because that's that's not right and it's not fair. Well, you should be voted. You should be. It should be determined based on your accomplishments as a, as a professional pool player and, uh, and how it... Uh, pertains to our our modern history in the United States and and um, and and for that I think you're well deserving I mean uh, you know talk about meteoric rise I mean at the age of 16 you're winning the Michigan State championship three times in a row like I, I mean like uh, how is that not a meteoric and then to win the world championship 
four years later, uh, in, or three years later in, uh, in 1971, uh, that, that, that's extremely meteoric, if not just amazing as a, as a pool player in general. And then, you know, I think, um, I think we place a lot of expectations on pool players. Um, you know, you kind, of, you kind of came around at a time also where pool was uh, under the microscope that there was a lot of uh, a lot of pressure to put pool in a place where it needed to be, like where where everybody expected it to be. They all wanted it to be this huge thing. You know, uh, you had the Camel Tour. You had uh, you know pool on TV starting to get big, and uh, and I think there was a lot of pressure for players to perform and uh, and 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 be likable on camera. And I think you did an amazing job of doing that. But also at the same time. I could imagine the pressure for you uh, during those years, that very small window of time in the late 80s and early 90s must have been very, very difficult for you because uh, this was not, this was not a, a place that you needed to be back in the 70s and early 80s. Um, but then back in the late 80s, um, there seemed to be like this huge uh, surge to, to put pool in the mainstream. Uh, would you well, agree with all that? Or I... uh, we, uh, as professional players back then, we were all in the same boat. You know, we were all hoping good things are going to happen. Good yeah. things are going to happen. You know, hang yeah, in yeah. there. Hang in there. I was getting very disgusted. And come the 1980s, I slowly started to go downhill. Uh, I was losing my desire to get in there and fight. Let me tell you something, you know, you're playing the greatest players in the world. You better be ready to, to let's get ready to rumble, okay? Right, and right. And when you lose that, it's time to go. And yeah. uh, I, did, like I said, I, I wish I would have quit 10 years earlier. I think I could have saved myself a lot of embarrassment, uh, not only in my attitude, but in the way that I was performing. I mean, I, I was, in my opinion, a bum. Well, I okay. think I think you tried to quit. You tried to quit twenty years earlier when you moved to Las Vegas to become a yeah, blackjack dealer. Yeah, I, I went to work as a dealer. Here, I yeah. got three titles under my belt, and and, uh, and I I'm going to dealer school. I'm going to go and, and, and get a job. Yeah. And it was the uh, it was the mob from Detroit that got me the job at the Tropicana, which at the time was one of the top places in town to work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To try to get one of those jobs back in the day. You had to know somebody. I don't care if you were the greatest dealer in town. If you didn't know somebody, you weren't going to work. Well, the mob put me to work, and I, you know, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being away from the dungeon, the the, the rat. I bet. I mean, it was. I just, I don't know. I was uh, confused. Uh, I, I just got tired of the gambling and the hustling. It's not what I wanted. You know, yeah. I wanted to try to make a decent living playing this game. Yeah. And when you find out that uh, without gambling, it, it's going to be pretty difficult, my friend. You know, how are you going to pay your bills? You know, you get one tournament every three months or something. And, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. 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 You know, a random Our thought. Hall just... of Fame this year, uh, there's 10 of us on this list. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned... We're all nine to one underdogs, and that's the way I look at it myself. I'm I'm just a nine to one underdog. Whoever wins it, well, they were a nine to one underdog also. <laughs> you know. Right, right. Well, all that aside, I you know I think your your accomplishments as a pool player, your lifetime achievements, um, are you know, you know, bar none. They're just. Uh, well, I'll tell you one, one thing that really amazes me. I mean, I understand this. I understand how things go, and I understand how things work in the world of pool. One thing that, that I look at that really has me uh, amazed, <laughs> do you realize that there is four Hall of Fames in the world of pool? <laughs> okay. Please elaborate. Now, you have the Women's Association Hall of Fame. Okay. So I, I wish I could have. They wouldn't let me play in the women's division, and I don't understand it, okay? <laughs> but anyhow, there's three uh, 
Hall of Fames in the men's division. Yeah. And you have the Louisville, you have the BCA, you have the World Straight Pool. Right. I, uh, I'm not in any of them. Now, there's and, also a one hot, one pocket uh, Hall of Fame now, too. I think well, it's Wisconsin or Wyoming. You know, Louisville is a one pocket in the bank pool and, no. the, and the Action Action Hall of Fame. Uh, but I'm not a member of any of those Hall of Fames. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say to myself, how many people are actually in the Hall of Fame? You know, I'm not talking about cue makers or manufacturers or authors. I'm talking about how many players are actually in the Hall of Fame in the men's division. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's say, uh, let's say for example, 100 players. Okay? Are you trying to tell me that of them 100 players, that I was the worst one <laughs> out of all of them? I beg your pardon. Uh, you know, <laughs> no. I just, uh, it's, be, that's the reason I never thought about the Hall of Fame. I mean, I, uh, I, I gave up on that uh, a long, long time ago. I see. Well, I don't, I don't want to have to put you in a place where you're putting it under the microscope because it obviously just, it just, you know, kerfuffles you. So, um, I, I want to move on. I want to, I want to basically, you know, I mean, I congratulate you for being, uh, nominated this year. Um, and, um, you know, I, I look forward to seeing your name. In the I still fame. got a shot at the uh, Hall of Fame. I'm making it as soon as they come with a, with a, uh, commentators Hall of Fame. And I got somebody I'd like to nominate. I'd like to nominate Larry Schwartz. I think he does a marvelous job. That's great. You know, he's watching by the way, he's in our chat room. Yeah, well, he's been around pool for 50 years. He's wrote articles for the Billiards Digest for over 25 years. Yeah. He's he knows every player that ever played, and pool is his life. And yeah. I want to. I think he does a great job with his commentary. I hope to have a commentary Hall of Fame someday. I'm gonna I'm gonna put my vote in for Larry Schwartz. Well, there is a United States. Uh... Uh, the USBMA, the uh, US, uh, uh, the US Billiard Media Association. So who knows? We'll see. Well, and so you know, in the world of pool, you never know what's 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 going to happen. It's uh, it's true. <laughs> a strange sport to predict why it has been on the back shelf for 60, 70 years. Because yeah. when you Consider the fact that of all non-physical sports, pocket billiards is the number one most difficult. Yes. It's above golf. It's above bowling. It's above every non-physical sport there is. Uh, degree of difficulty, pool is number one. There was an article, I believe, at possibly uh, Sports Illustrated some 30 years ago or something, mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And they, they talked about this. What is the most difficult sport of all the non-physical sports? Pool was number one, golf was number two, and bowling was number three. Hmm. And when you think that bowling, professional bowlers are making more money than professional pool players, I mean, I love bowling. Hey, it's a blast, okay? I love playing golf. I mean, it's just fun. But when you consider the degree of difficulty, which one is the most toughest? It's, it's pocket billiards. I agree. I agree. You know, because, you know, I've been around this sport for 62 years. I have world titles. Yeah. If someone was to come up to me and ask me, how much do you actually think you know about this sport? I'd have to be honest with them. I'd say I know about 15% of what there is to know. Yeah. You can take the greatest player in the world that ever lived, whoever that person may be, I will guarantee you that he's doing well if he knows 30% of, yeah. of what there is to yeah, know yeah. because it's a never-ending learning experience. You're always improvising. You have you come up with shots that you've never never been in the, in that type of situation before. Yeah. How do you hit the shot? What's the right speed? Is it an offensive shot? Is it a defensive shot? These are things you don't even know. Now... Tell me how much improvising is there in bowling? How much improvising is there in the game of golf? 
Uh, you know, it, there's no question that non-physical sports pool is the boss. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a shame <clears throat> that these players of today and for the last 70 years, it's a shame that they don't have a chance to make big money like other sports do. Yeah. You know? It is a shame. <clears throat> but it's, well, been, I, but it's but been like yeah. that, too. It's been like that for many years. It's not just... The players of today it's the players of yesteryear as well right yeah i mean listen i played for more money 40 years ago than what these players play for today and i'm just telling you that's a fact i yeah. played for money 40 years ago yeah i know i know and, uh you know and what's really pathetic you watch tv like i was watching yesterday and they got on two hours of cornhole, okay? <laughs> now, you know, it's fun to go out in the backyard with your friends and your family and have some barbecue, and, and the, the guy's got a cornhole thing out there. You know, it's fun to just fool around. But uh, you got cornhole on TV for two hours. You don't have any pocket figures. There's no, you know, I mean, I don't get it. I really don't, and yeah. it's a shame. Well, it was... Uh, we're splitting, we're splitting hairs now, but uh, I mean, because I, obviously, you know, I can see the attraction to something like cornhole because, uh, you know, a sports channel would, uh, would definitely want to do it because it's the kind of sport where the spectator would look at it and say, I could do that. And that's what makes them, that's what makes them want to watch it because they're probably looking at it going, I could, do, I could be that guy, you know, and so it's going to get ratings. You know? And I'll tell you what else I saw the other day. First time I ever seen it, never even heard of it. Cherry pit spitting. Did you? Are you I, hip I to did this? not. <laughs> I did not know that cherry pit spitting was uh, becoming a thing. Spitting. I saw this on TV the other day, and I'm <laughs> thinking to myself, man, uh, geez, uh, pocket biggers can't even. Uh, get on the air and, and we're, we're watching cherry pit spitting. We're okay. watching cornhole. We're watching hot dog eating. Contest. Yeah. <laughs> what? You know, slap, pit? slap fighting is big in Russia too. You know, what is slap fighting? Slap, slap. <laughs> they slap each other. Slap each other. Okay. Yeah. They slap each other. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. Anyway, look, uh, I don't want to digress. Um, I, I, I want to thank you, Jimmy, for your time today. And, um, and uh, you know, I'll have to get your mailing address because I want to send out something nice for you. But um, <clears throat> real you quick. Pictures in the post office. You can find me easy. Yeah, I can, <laughs> exactly. Um, I want to ask go, you. I want to say hello to all my, my best friends. Okay, all my please best do. Friends. All from the Rum Runner, I've got to say hello to all of these guys because I know they're sitting there listening. So, and you know them all too. I know. I want to say to the, the number one boss, Gino Hill, guy that uh, does everything he can for pool, as you know. Uh, yeah. We need a lot more guys like Gino Hill. We do. Uh, we do. He's a great guy. I want to say hello to Joe Canella and Al Lawrence and Jim Blakeman. Ryan DeBerg and Darren Domingo and uh, Christina Gonzalez and say hello to uh, Tommy Baker and his uh, lovely wife, Lisa. I want to say hello to Steve Bergen. Uh, I hope I'm not leaving anybody out here. And uh, I just, you know, Phil hello Tatum. All those guys. They're all my best friends. Phil Tatum. Phil Tatum. Oh, yeah, Bill Taylor. I knew I was leaving somebody out. Katie, Katie, Katie and her husband? Yeah, a a Amy Kane and uh, all of them. You know, I mean, they're just, they're all wonderful people there, and they're all family there, as you yeah. know. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, everybody I at the Rum Runners family. I know, I know. And um, and I, I always look forward to going to Vegas to see you guys, so... Uh, uh, speaking of which, too, uh, you know, you do have some immediate uh, siblings and family as well. You you want to say hi to them? Yeah, my brother, he's, he's listening, uh, and he's, he's, he's doing gangbusters with all this virus stuff because he runs a meat business. He has uh, oh, wow. Western beef and seafood, and he has a, all kinds.
kinds of trucks that drive all over Vegas every day, Western beef and seafood. So he's making a killing with this because everybody needs meat. Yeah, yeah. And well, people are running out of meat. Yeah, so. thank you. Thank you for your service. I mean, it's, you know, these guys on the front lines, they're the real heroes of this whole pandemic, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. My brother's a hero. He's feeding everybody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and Monique's watching. Yeah, my favorite niece, Monique. Yeah. I got a million nephews and nieces, and I mean, they're all, uh, they're all listening right yeah. now, so... Uh, one, one last thing, actually, when you talk about players today, I mean, let's let's take about out. I know there are a lot of things about modern pool today that you really don't like, like the jump cues and the measles balls and, and all that. <laughs> who are your favorite players today? Who who do you really like today? Well, I tell you what, an amazing player, uh, obviously, is Alex Pagulian. Yeah. You know, I mean, all of the Filipino players are, uh, I really like his attitude. He's always smiling. He's always, uh, you know, joking around. And uh, yeah. you know, all those Filipino players are really nice guys. You know, you forget about their talents. Uh, that speaks for itself. But yeah. you're all really nice people. You know, they, they're a different, uh, they're a different flavor than the American players, you yeah. know, you know, and the European players, uh, they're all gentlemen. And, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to have all those champions, uh, with us today, you know, because back in my era of pool, the Americans just completely dominated. I mean, yeah, the Americans were, there's no question. They were the best players in the world. Right. Right. Uh, Oh, you got the Europeans and you got the Filipinos, and and it's fun to watch the difference in styles that they have. It really is. It really you is. You know, they they bring a that foreign flavor to the game. You yeah. know, and yeah. uh, it, it's fun to watch those guys. I know what to expect from the American players, but with those guys, you don't know uh, quite what to expect. They shoot shots differently. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun to watch those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, what what style would you say? I mean, well, hold on. But you, I think you're forgetting about the players from Hungary too. Oh yeah, Bill Moss. <laughs> Boy, that guy. He, every time I've seen him play, he's fantastic. And I tell you, when I uh, was commentating a match with uh, Bill Moss and uh, Oscar. Yeah. It was one of the best matches I ever saw, and it was a shame that one of them had to lose because they both just shot the lights out. I mean, it yeah. was. I really enjoyed watching that. I haven't seen a great match like that in some time. Sure. I mean, it, it, it was really tremendous. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you what, whether or not you have a cue in your hand today, or, or, or you know. Or, Playing or not playing, Jimmy, I'm really, really honored and proud that you're still amongst us, pool players. You know, you still represent the game, even though you don't play it nowadays. Um, you still are a, a mentor to me, and I'm sure to a lot of other people out there, aspiring players, to pool fans, and also to the veterans that used to know you. Um, I, you know, I... I, uh, I, I just, I'm honored that you're still around with us. And, uh, you know, I just wanted you to know that. Uh, well, I'm honored to be your friend and I'm honored to be the friend of all them guys at the Rum Runner. I mean, they're, they're family to me, yeah. you know, they're absolute family. And about all as I can say to all the people out there that like to play pool and everything, Play pool and have fun, my friends, because that's what it's all about. Have fun. And when, if there's ever a time where it's not fun for you, then it's time to lay down your cue. Thank you for that, Jimmy. That's, that's, uh, that is the biggest truth of all. Yeah. So with that, I, uh, I want to say thanks, and I hope you have a great week, and we'll talk uh, a little later. And... Anything else? No, I guess that about covers it all. Uh, trying to figure if there's anybody we left out. Did we leave out anybody? 
Uh, we probably did. But hey, you know, we can always have another interview. Right, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. We can do this again next week. Okay. Yeah. I'll hey, get may there. maybe what I'd like to do is, <laughs> is I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to have you and, and, and another guest on together. So let's talk about the possibility of doing that sometime soon in the future. And maybe we'll do it um, with a Zoom conference call and, uh, and we'll be so, able to... I am, I am not a computer wizard. Uh, Zoom, whatever that is, I trust that you're talking about actually uh, looking at the person you're talking to. Yeah, it's video conferencing, so so we'll right. hopefully we'll get to that point. But uh, I understand now that you just didn't want to be on camera because of the, the, you know, because of the hair, yeah. right? <laughs> if you look at me now, everybody would turn off. They, they turn All right. Station on, you know, watching, uh, you know, I was a teenage werewolf or something. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Jimmy. We'll talk to you soon, and. Uh, and thanks to all of you guys out there, too, who are watching today. Okay, say hello to the boss with the sauce, Geraldine. I will. I'll give Geraldine my love from you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, that was, uh, that was the great Jimmy Mattia, Pretty Boy Floyd, as he's, as he's known. And I did not know that, uh, how his name came about uh, in the late 80s. Uh, with, when a producer was uh, trying to come up with a nickname for him so that he could have a nickname on a pool video. Very interesting, uh, very interesting story. Also, great stories uh, hearing about him and how he met uh, uh, Ava Mattia or Ava, Ava Svensson as she was known back then. Now she is known as Ava Mattia Lawrence. Um, and also some really good stories about his uh, meteoric rise to fame <laughs> in uh, the U.S. Uh, pool scene. So I hope you guys all enjoyed that interview. Um, hopefully we'll be doing more in the future. Uh, like I said, folks, POV Pool is streaming live every Sunday and every Wednesday, whether or not it be a podcast or whether or not I just play the ghost or we'll do something. I promise you, I'll be with you guys uh, two days a week, Sundays and Wednesdays, uh, on POB Pool's YouTube channel. So please subscribe, and uh, don't forget to leave us a comment, and uh, you know, keep loving pool, everybody. And we'll see you when this damn pandemic's all over. We'll see you in the pool room. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Keep loving pool.